Hello and welcome, this is Dawn. So today I have a very special video for you. I'm going to apologize in advance if I seem all over the place because I am super excited to share with you guys my best friend Kelly Taylor's very first stamp set. So I might, um, I might ramble, I might gush over her, and I might be all over the place. I'm gonna apologize first. Okay, so this stamp set is the lovely Lilies, and she is releasing this with the rabbit hole designs. It is available right now. As you can see, these illustrations are amazing. I am so, so proud of her, and like I said, so excited for her. They also released some matching dies to go with it, and guys, I'm telling you, if you want this stamp set, pause. Hit the link in the description box below and grab it. The It released on April 24th, and it sold out in under 24 hours. So it is back in stock right now, but if you want it, like I said, hit pause and go grab it. Trust me, you will love it. All right, so here I'm just showing you all of the dies included in the die set, which there is one for every image in this set. There's also two sentiments included in the set, and I will be using the one um, about distance. I can't remember the exact wording offhand. You'll see it in the photos. <laughs> okay, so I am using Fabriano Artistico's Hot Pressed watercolor paper today. This is their extra white. Uh, in the past videos, the past few videos, I've used cold press. Today we're using hot press. It is a little bit different and I will point those differences out as we're painting. I'm gonna use the Fisker stamp press along with the Distress Ink and Antique Linen to stamp this out. I wanna do no line watercoloring and as you know, the Antique Linen Distress Ink is my favorite for no line watercolor. I haven't used this image yet so I'm just rubbing my hand across the stamp. This kind of helps to um, take any of that residue from manufacturing off. And then I'm going to repeatedly stamp this around the perimeter of my paper here to create almost a frame. Now normally when I'm stamping on watercolor paper I am using a misty because I may need to stamp several times. However, here is one of the differences um, with the hot press and the cold press. So the hot pressed watercolor paper has a smoother texture. There isn't as much tooth as there is in the cold press watercolor paper. So I can get away with using the stamp press because my impression is gonna be much cleaner and I don't have to worry about double stamping. So one of the first things you'll notice, um, a difference in this between the this video and the last couple of videos that I've done on watercolor is I'm gonna use a lot less water. You'll notice that I am blotting my brush off on the paper towel much more thoroughly. I'm pushing it into it and giving it a couple seconds to really pull that moisture out of the brush. So I'm using a lot less water on hot pressed watercolor paper. Now the reason I do this is because hot pressed watercolor paper has been pressed by heat. So all, all of your good quality watercolor paper is cotton, 100% cotton, and when you iron it, for lack of a better term. When you iron it down, you're pushing all those fibers really close and tight together. And the water is going to soak into that much slower than it would with the cold pressed, which has not, those fibers have not been compacted and pressed together with heat. For that reason, I use less water because it takes longer for that water to soak into the paper. This also means that you can get a lot more detail more easily on your hot press paper because it's a much smoother surface. You don't have the texture and the divots from the cold pressed watercolor paper. Now that is not to say that hot press is better or cold press is better, it's a personal preference. I use them both and I get different looks from both of them. So if I like really loose and washy and expressive or abstract, I'm, I'm going for cold press all day long. If I wanna do um, hyper realism or something just a little more detailed um, I'm going for hot pressed so it's really a personal preference all right so I'm gonna go back and forth between real time and uh, hyper time lapse because this is a lot to watercolor and we will be here all day which isn't a bad thing because I could gush about Kelly all day but I will be respectful of your time <laughs> Speaking of gushing about Kelly. All right, so this, like I mentioned, is her very first stamp set. And let's just get the um, burning question out of the way right out of the gate. 
why did Kelly not release a stamp set with W plus nine? There's actually a couple of reasons, uh, some of them which are probably better suited for another video. However, one of the main reasons for me is kind of selfish. Um, I wanted Kelly to do this on her own. Now, that doesn't mean that I was not there to support and champion her. I never left her side as far as cheering her on and telling her she could do this. However, I did not want to be an employer-employee relationship. I did not want to be her client for her first set because I believe in throwing somebody into the deep end. I know not everybody agrees with this, but I selfishly did not want to be Kelly's deep end. I wanted to be her shallow end, okay? I wanted to be the spot where she could come back to if she felt like she couldn't quite touch bottom, if the water got a little too deep. I wanted to play the role of her, her cheerleader, her champion, her best friend. Um, and I did not want any aggravation or frustration with me. Not to say that there was any of that with her set. Don't get me wrong. I don't know what went on over there. But I have been a freelance artist, graphic artist, graphic designer, web designer. I have worked in corporate. So I know. <laughs> I know what can go down. I know the frustration. I know when your vision doesn't match with your client's vision. And I know how it can get quite sticky. So I wanted to be... Like I said, her best friend in this situation. I wanted to be her champion. I wanted to be her mentor for a lack of a better term. Maybe she didn't consider me her mentor, but you know what I'm saying. I wanted to be her safe space. So completely, completely selfish on my part. But another main reason is I did not want her to feel like she did not earn this. So if I had released her first stamp set, she would always wonder, was it actually good enough or did I release it just because I'm her best friend? And she knows me well enough to know that I would not do that. However, there would be that doubt. And I wanted her to know that she is amazing, that her artwork is amazing, and that she earned this. She went out and she pitched her own illustrations to someone who wasn't her best friend and who was willing to publish her artwork because her artwork is amazing and there is no doubt about it. Now, again, some of you may not agree with that, but it was so much fun and I got so much enjoyment out of watching her grow and watching her confidence and, of course, helping her to realize that she had it in her to do this because we all ride that self-doubt. We will, we, we ride that wave. We ride it hard, I know. And I love that I was able, look y'all, I'm going to tear up. It's a stamp set, but I'm super proud of her. I am so proud of her. And now she has no doubt that she earned it all on her own. And it was because her artwork is amazing and not because somebody did her a favor. Okay, so I have finished up all of the flowers in this illustration. And now I'm going to start in with my greens. I've let everything completely dry so that my greens don't bleed into my other colors. Can we just talk for a minute? how this looks like a hot mess. And I always tell you guys, watercolor looks horrible until it doesn't. So just bear with me. <laughs> We're gonna go real time here. And I'm adding in the stems here on these side facing lilies. I'm using a number two Princeton Heritage 4050 series round brush. And this is gonna help me get into these little tight spaces. And you can see that I am basically just filling in the stamp illustration here. I'll also use the very tip of my brush to slightly pull that up between each of the petals. I'm pulling that green just between the petals 
so that it doesn't look like it's just, it looks like it's actually growing into, it's growing. The petals are growing from the base of the stem and not like the stem was just attached to the petals. Okay, so I did the rest of the stems and now we're going to do the leaves. I'm gonna switch back over to the number five uh, Princeton Velvet Touch Round Brush. That is what I've been using for the rest of the painting, in case I forgot, I don't think I mentioned it. So the entire painting, I only use two brushes. I use the Princeton Heritage 4050 Series number two brush. I'm lying, I use three brushes. So for the flowers, all the leaves, I use the Princeton Velvet Touch number five. And then for the stamen and the dots on the lilies and the stem areas, I used a number zero and a number two Princeton 4050 series. I will have all of this linked in the description box below for you guys. So if you have, if you ever have a question about anything that I'm using in the videos, I try to make sure that I have everything linked in the description box below. So you can check there. And if for some reason I missed it or forgot it, just drop it in the comments and I will let you know what I used. All right, so I've approached the leaves the same way that I did the petals, that first layer of the petals. I put down a couple dots of pigment and then I used the damp brush to pull that pigment out and fill in the entire leaf area. And then I dropped in some heavier color and I'm softening that out. So I did the rest of the leaves the exact same way and now everything is dry. Our first layer has been laid down on everything and it's time to really bring these to life. Now you could stop here if you just, well, you'd probably want to do your stamens, but <laughs> you could stop with just the one layer if you wanted a softer look. I do want to add some more detail and I really want to bring this gorgeous illustration to life and really show off all of the detail that Kelly has included in this illustration. So she's drawn in some detailed lines into the stamp, which indicates some veining in the petals themselves. She's also got the dots that the lilies have on them. Um, I don't know what they're called. I should probably know that. But the little speckled dots that are on the lily, she's got those drawn in there. And then she has some directional lines illustrated in there as well. So I'm using those as my guide to come in here and add some deeper color and kind of, um, add some movement to the petals, add a little bit of shading, and again, pull out some of those lines that she has illustrated into the stamp set itself. So I've picked up a darker, I wanna say that I took that yellowy orange and I added a little burnt sienna to it. And this is just going to give me a muted, deeper version of that orangey color. And I'm gonna use this color to add my shadows to all of these uh, orange lilies. So I'm going to add that anywhere that I need to insert some shadow. So anytime that one petal is on top of another, anywhere that the petals are recessing into the center of the flower. So for instance, this petal here is, it's coming up out of the center and then it is folding over, folding back. So it's creating this big curve. So I'm adding a little bit of depth to the very base of the petal, and then I'm adding a little depth to the very end of the petal, and I'm leaving that center area light. So this is going to give the illusion that this petal is curved over. So it's coming up and curving over. I'm then gonna use that same color to separate this petal from the petal beside it. So what you'll want to do is be careful not to create, don't draw a straight line to separate your two petals, right? I added a little bit of pigment there in the middle and then I'm using my damp brush to spread and soften that. It's going to give me different levels. It's not going to look like a straight line, like I drew a shadow line. You want to have variance in your depth of shadows and sometimes you won't even see much of a shadow. So try to refrain from outlining everything. Um, it's going to look much more realistic um, and much softer if you just pick certain points to add some deeper darks to and then leave some of your shadows, even your shadows, leave some of them a little bit lighter. Everything is gonna have different levels from your lights to your midtones to your darks. You're gonna have super bright highlights and then you'll have lighter lights. You'll have super deep darks and then lighter darks. 
So there's try, just try, try not to outline it. And something that I do is, and I still try to remind myself of this because I will get caught up in it. And the next thing I know, I have added the same depth to every single petal. Here, I'm going to pick like three petals to uh, really add some deep darks to. I'm not going to do the exact same thing to every single petal. I'm just going to pick like three or four, add some darks, add some striations in, on the petals themselves, and I'll leave the other ones a little looser. I think it's really easy to get in the zone and just keep going. And if that, and if you're doing that, that's fine. You're going to learn um, the repeti re repetitiveness, repetitive, repeating. What's, what am I trying to say? The best way to learn something is to do it repeatedly. So even if you do end up going overboard and you don't like the final result, I guarantee you, you learned something in the process because you did the same thing over and over and over again. I also like to work on all of the same color at once. So I've mixed up my darker, my, I, this is my mid-tone actually, because I do come in with one, one darker layer. So I mixed up all of my mid-tone and did all of my yellow flowers that required that color. And then I'm going to mix up a mid-tone for my pink. And for that, I'm just going a little bit deeper than I did for the initial layer. I haven't added any green or anything to really knock this back because I'm trying to keep it nice and bright and vibrant. And really, this is going to be kind of my mid-tone. So I didn't add any, um, I didn't want it to be shadowed per se. I can glaze a shadow over this, and I do at the very end, and I will show that to you. Again, you'll notice here, I'm using those lines that Kelly drew into the stamp and creating some movement in the petal. Using that really small brush there to go around some of the stamen. This is what we call negative painting. I'm not painting the stamen, I'm painting around them and leaving the stamen the white of the paper. And this is gonna make them stand out. Here, this petal has a little flip, so I'm adding a little bit of darker color underneath blending it down and leaving the tip of that petal light and it'll look like it's flipped over. And again, I'll repeat the same steps for all the remaining flowers. And now it's time to take a look at those stamen. You can see now how they're standing out against the darks that we negatively painted behind them. I'm going to take that same flower color. I'm going to water it down. I'm going to water it down a lot. Lots of water, very little pigment, and I'm going to glaze that over the stamen. That's it. I looked at a lot of color or a lot of pictures of lilies and they all have different centers, but a lot of them, the stamen part is the same color as the flower, just lighter, a lighter version of the flower color. So that's what I'm doing here. So for the pink ones, I'll take a very light wash of the pink and paint it over the stamens and a very light wash of the yellow and paint that over the stamens of the yellow ones. And because watercolor is transparent, this is not going to block out everything that I did underneath. I'm just adding a very, very dilute layer of pigment over top of what I've already done. And the white paper will take that first layer and everything underneath, it will just glaze another layer of that color over top and it will not disturb what we already laid down. Okay, so I let those completely dry and now I'm adding the very tops of those stamen. I've already done the yellow one and now I'm working on this pink one. I've picked up some dark brown and I lay down a speck of pigment with the smaller zero brush and now I'm using the damp number two brush to just soften out one side of it. Kind of kind of making it into an oval shape. And this will leave one side dark and heavier and one side light giving it that domed or rounded look. So again, I've just put down a little bit of pigment at the top of each of the stamen and then using that damp number two brush to just soften out one side of it. Now, if you get it too light, you can always just hit it again with the smaller brush, which in this case is my zero and I have some of that pigment on it. I'll show you one more and then we'll move on. 
So I'm going to pick up some of that dark brown and I'm just going to lay down a dot or a line on one side of the top of that stamen and then use that damp brush to just soften out the top edge. And then I'll let all of those dry. Whew, this is a long one. Sorry, guys. We actually have two cards, too. So if you're hanging in there, thank you so much. Um, hopefully, I haven't bored you to death. We are on to the last step of this one, and that is adding in these uh, dots, the speckles that are all over the petals of the tiger lilies. So here we are going to pick up that same dark brown that we used for the stamen. And we're just going to create a series of dots. Now I'm working kind of in a half circle motion. So I will create a row of dots in a half circle, move up, create another row of dots in a half circle. And I'm varying the weight or the size of each of the dots. So sometimes I will just lightly touch the paper for a very small dot. And then other times I will kind of just push on the brush a little bit harder to create a larger dot. And I'm trying not to create a, um, a really visible pattern. I am loosely going in a half circle, but trying to keep it just a little random. And again, I will repeat this for all of the flowers. And I'm going to use that same brown for all of them. And you can really see how much these little finishing touches really add to the depth and dimension of this illustration. Now, I think that this turned out absolutely gorgeous. It turned out way more beautiful than I um, had even hoped. So it, that's easy to do, though, when you start off with a gorgeous illustration. <laughs> I'm not biased at all. Okay, I might be a little biased, but we're just going to, y'all are going to let me have that right? You're gonna let me have it. I'm biased. But it is. It is a gorgeous illustration. Okay, so you could stop here. You could be done. I think it looks amazing. However, I love my cast shadows. So I'm going to come in and add in a few cast shadows. Now what those are are the shadows that would result from anything being on top of each other or above another thing. So I'm going to take a very dilute uh, purplish, blue, a little bit of gray in it. And I'm going to water that down so it's very thin. And then I'm going to add that everywhere something is laying over another thing. So if you have one type of leaf, it's over the other type of leaf there, I'm going to add a shadow. That petal is curved up over that leaf, I'm going to add a shadow under it. Anywhere that... Um, any of the petals are overlapping anywhere that one thing is above another and then also in the very centers of the the flowers themselves i want to really push those centers deep and to do that again i'm going to take that very dilute purplish bluish gray and i'm just going to swipe a ring around the center you can see here, I'm just adding a little bit in a circle in the very center of the flowers. That's it. Don't overthink it. Don't keep going back and messing with it. Just add that cast shadow there in the center. And that's going to push those centers even more so that they appear a little more recessed. Okay, so now it's time to do our sentiment. Now, off camera, I painted a couple more uh, individual flowers and a swag because I feel like originally I felt like I was going to need some more. And so I painted them, die cut them, and I was going to fill in some of the bare spots. However, this is slightly bigger than an A2 panel right now. And once I cut it down, I I felt like it looked best with some white space. It, it needed that little bit of breathing room. Adding in all of the extra just kind of cluttered it up too much. So, but don't worry, we're gonna use those extra pieces and create a bonus card. All right, so for the sentiment, I've cut a panel using the Spellbinders Fluted Rectangles die from 80 pound Nina Solar White Super Smooth cardstock. And we're gonna do a little bit of foiling. And for that, we're gonna use the Spellbinders Essential Duo Lines Glimmer Plate. I love this glimmer plate set. It's beautiful to use with all of your watercolor pieces. It just kind of takes them up a step. 
And then for the sentiment, we're going to use the distance means so little when someone means so much. We're just going to stamp that onto this panel and we'll just pop that up on the front. We're going to be foiling with the Satin Rose Gold Glimmer Foil from Spellbinders. Um, I love this. This one is a new to me and I love that rose gold shade. Now it would be easier to foil this on a larger sheet of cardstock first and then die cut it. However, I was creating on the fly and I didn't know I was going to be foiling first, so I had already cut my panel. So I'm gonna create a little hinge, I'm gonna add a little tape here, and then I'm gonna fold that over around to the back and then I'm going to sandwich my foil in between. I'll put that onto my glimmer machine plate side down put on my shim and my spacer pad, push timer, and then when that's done, I can go ahead and run this through my platinum. And the heat from that plate, along with the pressure from the Spellbinders Platinum 6, will transfer that foil design onto my cardstock. Now you can see over there on the side, I'm still messing around at this point, thinking I'm gonna use those extra pieces on this card. But in the end, like I said, we end up getting a bonus card out of this. So now we're gonna stamp our sentiment for that. I'm using some Ranger Archival ink in black i love just simple black stamping with watercolor i think it sets it off um, if you wanted to you could definitely heat emboss this and that would look beautiful as well all right so now it's just time to assemble this one i went ahead and trimmed that panel down and here you can see that i think that it's perfect i i didn't want to overcrowd it and that white space that we have is just enough to let those florals breathe and to keep with the simplicity, we're just going to attach this to the front using some liquid adhesive. And I've used a little bit of fun foam on the back just to give it a little lift. Super simple, super elegant. Okay, so now are you ready for that bonus card? We have those leftover pieces that I had already watercolored and I thought about using on the previous card. And I decided why not make something using another new product from the rabbit hole designs. We're going to make a flat shaker pop-up shadow box card. Like, I know, that's a lot, right? That's a mouthful. Flat shaker pop-up shadow box. Okay, so I have a panel here that is five and a quarter by five and a half. I'm going to score in from the edge one quarter, and then I'm going to score in from the edge at one half. I'm going to flip the card stock and do a score at one quarter, and then score again in from the edge one half. So that gives me two quarter inch scores on either side. And if this is gonna be a shadow box, then we need a window. I'm using the Fluted Classics Ovals die from Spellbinders here to cut this oval from the center of that center panel. I like to tape my die in place just so that it doesn't move and I make sure that I have it centered. And then I'm gonna go ahead and fold my score lines. So I'm gonna fold the first one towards me, burnish that with my bone folder, and then I'm gonna fold the second one away from me, burnish that with my bone folder, and then I'm gonna do the same thing for the other side. Now this is, it's creating like a little accordion fold, and this is the mechanism that's gonna do the pop-up. Now this is something that I um, picked up off of Jennifer McGuire's video, so if you want in-depth instructions on how to do these, make sure you check that out. But in the meantime, this is a super simple quick one. So there you can see it causes it to pop up and create a little shadow box, a little pop-up shadow box that also lays flat to go through the mail. But let's dress it up a little bit. So we're gonna use the Honeybee Stamps Clover Petal 3D embossing folder, and we're gonna add some texture to the front of this pop-up. Now you'll notice that I went ahead and burnished my score lines first, even though I'm gonna put this through the folder flat. Now the reason I did that is because the folder is a little bit wider than four and a quarter and it's going to end up giving me some 3D embossing on my flat part, on my pop-up part. But because I reinforced and scored and I reinforced and burnished those score lines, I'm going to be able to easily fold them, refold them after they come out, even though they have that 3D embossing texture on it. I did try it the first time without folding my lines first, and it was a little bit harder to fold it directly on those scores because all of the pressure and the texture that this plate adds into it, um, it made it hard to find the actual fold. So by folding it and burnishing it and then 3D embossing it, there was enough memory 
on that fold line that I was able to cleanly fold it back. So here, I'll show you. So I'm gonna take my bone folder again because again, I have some of that 3D texture on my fold. So when I fold this back here, you can see there's a little bit of bumpy texture. I'm gonna burnish that out with my bone folder again. But you can see that I was easily able to fold that side back even though it had all of that extra texture in there. So again, here, you'll be able to see it more on this side. I've got some texture on that fold. I'm just gonna use my bone folder to burnish that flat. And again, it easily folded back. It had that memory because I had already scored, folded, and burnished my fold lines. So there we go. Now we have a pop-up shadow box with a 3D embossed front. But wait, there's more. All right, so the rabbit hole came out with these A2 Shaker acetate sheets. And these things are amazing. They're nice and thick. They have all of the pre-adhesed sides there and they're all scored. They give you the recommended panel size of four and an eighth by five and three eighths, which I've already cut down here. And that's the perfect size to fit inside here as your backer. Now, like I mentioned, these are nice and thick. They have a protective film on the front too that you'll wanna remove. Now, <laughs> this can be hard to get started. So what I've found is the easiest way is to take your nail or your tweezers or something and kind of scrape at the edge here. Just kind of dig into it and eventually it'll start to come up and release. So here you can see I'm showing you that film. Now what I like to do is leave that on until the very end, the very, very end. It's gonna protect it from any fingerprints or scratches or static, all that good stuff. All right, so what I like to do is fold back all of the sides and, and get them started. Then I will remove the release tape from three sides and fold them back. I like to leave the top side open, so I'll do one short side and the two long sides, and then I'll leave that top side open to fill with my shaker bits. I can't express how much fun I had playing with the stamp set, and I'm not gonna lie, it was very daunting. Um, <laughs> I wanted to represent the stamp set to the absolute best of my ability because I am so freaking proud of Kelly. Now, I, I know I've mentioned her a lot, and if you're not familiar with Kelly, I will leave a link to her channel in the description box below. But it was like nothing that I was making was good enough for Kelly. <laughs> I can't, I just... Like I said, she has been on my design team for a long time. Um, I don't know, maybe 10 years or so. And she has always, always had my back. And I wanted to make sure that I had her back in the same manner. So it was, it was like I had to represent, you know? <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully I came through. Um, it wasn't difficult because like I said, the illustration is gorgeous. To fill this, I have used one of the free bags of sequins that um, the rabbit hole includes in your orders. So this particular order, I think I think they're for each release, they changed the color combo or something, but they're pre-mixed like this. This was the black and white mix. And I actually thought that the black and white was perfect to go with the yellowy orange tiger lilies. So here, I'm just flipping over some of the bigger sequins. Now you would think, or the rhinestones, I'm sorry. Now you would think that you couldn't put these fatter rhinestones in to this shaker card, but you can. So you can see here that it actually gives you plenty of room for even those big rhinestones to shake around. So that's one of the other things that I really, really like about these flat shaker sheets. They're, yeah, they shot to the top of my favorites list. So now that I know everything is sealed up and I know what I'm gonna do with this, I'm gonna go ahead and remove that protective film. Like I mentioned, I like to save it until last. So I just use my fingernail or you could use your tweezers or something sharp to just kind of pick at that edge. That release film will just come up there and then I will just peel it away and you'll see that it is crystal clear. There we go, so pretty. All right, so now I just adhered those leftover pieces to the front of my panel using some liquid adhesive, and I'm using a heavy acrylic block to hold it in place just to give that liquid adhesive time to, um, time to take hold. 
And then any extra pieces that I want to tuck in, if I need to, I can just trim those down and then just tuck them in where I want them. To adhere that pop-up panel to my shaker card base here, I'm going to use some 1 8 inch double-sided adhesive and I'm applying that to the very outer scored edge of each side. I'll then come in and use my bone folder to burnish that just to make sure that I have good adhesion. Now when I adhere it, I'm only going to I'm only going to adhere one side at a time. So I'm going to remove the release tape from one side and then I'm going to lay that over my panel, lining up the edges, and then I'll push that into place. I'll turn it around and do the same thing to the other side. So I'll remove that release tape and then line that up with the edges. Now here's the tip. I like to line up the center first, so I won't push down. I'll line up the center first, push that down, and then push it towards the edge. That's going to help me make sure that it's straight. If I start at one edge, it's easy for it to go crooked. But another tip would be if you're having issues lining it up, you can always put liquid adhesive over top of that double-sided adhesive. It will give you a little bit of wiggle room and playtime to make sure that they are perfectly lined up without grabbing and adhering too soon. And then all that's left is to add our sentiment. And again, I'm gonna pull a little trick that I learned from Jennifer. Um, again, if you want very detailed instructions on these pop-up shadow boxes, make sure you check out her channel. She's got a lot of different styles. I don't think I've seen one where she paired it with a flat shaker, but the basic construction, she has very good instructions with a lot of different styles. All right, and for our sentiment today, I'm using the Honeybee Stamps. This one's for the girls stamp set. Uh, it's, I'm using the large Happy Mother's Day sentiment in there. I've gone ahead and stamped that in black and die cut that as well. And we're going to adhere that to a little strip of acetate that I'm going to float across the window of this card. So I'm using liquid adhesive to adhere that to the acetate strip. And I've laid it on top of my card here just so I can get placement. I want to make sure that it's centered. And it's easier to do if I'm lining it up over the window. And then I'm going to use some double-sided adhesive again on the front of the acetate. I'll remove the release tape and then just tuck that into the window. So I'll tuck one side in and push down so that it will grab it. And then I will tuck the other side in. Now this is acetate, so it's flexible. I'll just tuck that in and then grab it on the other side. And that finishes up our cards. I wanna thank you guys for sticking around. I know this was a long one, but again, this was a very special video for me. I had so much fun using this stamp set and I am so incredibly proud of Kelly. I did not doubt you for a second, girl. Everything about this stamp set is amazing. If you guys are looking to pick it up, make sure you check the description box below. I'll have a link to it. It did sell out in 24 hours the day it was released. It is now back in stock, so make sure you jump on it. Do not delay. I will also have links to Kelly's channel down below if you want to check out her work and check out the cards that she made with this set. Absolutely beautiful cards colored with Copic markers. As always, I want to thank you guys for watching. And I will see you in the next video. Bye.